Well, it is that time for another Pilates Hour with Polestar. And uh, today is a special uh, webinar. And I know I've gotten a lot of comments already coming in from Instagram and from emails and Facebook. And so I know a lot of you are excited about today. And I'm really excited with our guests. And before we start and introduce uh, Kim and Diego to you, a lot of you might already know them. Um, I want to give you a little idea of where this came from. And uh, it was probably a couple of weeks ago. I think we were in the, um, it was with Liz Bussey. And we were talking about dealing with um, the stress and the spiritual well being of dealing with crisis. And there was uh, something I was struggling with at that time. I was struggling with this idea that. You know, even though I'm not trained to be a medical doctor, like on the front line, I was feeling some kind of urge inside, like I needed to be on the front line. And I remember listening to Liz. One of the things she said is like, just stop. And it's not like, yes, go to New York. No, don't go to New York. Yes, put a face mask on. No, don't put a face mask on and go into, you know, a place to be able to help people. But it was like, just stop and listen. And when I stopped and listened, um, I just felt this, like, you know what, I, I, I need to talk about service. And um, wasn't sure how that was even going to manifest. I don't even know that that was the word that came to my mind. But I felt prompted to give Kim Jabalisco a call. So I called Kim. And we were talking. And Kim is an avid uh, professional in the Pilates industry and a leader in many different ways and very well educated trust her opinion a lot. And we started talking and she's like, Brent, let's just dedicate a whole webinar to service. Let's talk about volunteerism. You know, you always talk about it in full start. Let's do that. So um, that resonated immediately. I thought, okay, we're going to do the next one in order um, on service and on uh, paying it forward. And we thought that was a great idea. And no sooner did I sort of have the you know, decision with Kim thinking about that, that I thought of a conversation that I had, a very intimate conversation with Diego Balesteros a number of months ago. We went out to dinner together, and I know him as a businessman, as a business partner, as a collaborator, as a leader in the, in the technical world. And we sat down and had a very spiritual conversation, and I got to know a side of Diego that probably most of you don't know, and I wanted to bring that out of his philanthropy, his philanthropy and also um, just his love for helping other people and things that he's done and the ways he sort of looks at it. So um, here we are today. So I have Kim and I have Diego with me. Um, just to preface, Diego is from Madrid and Diego has been practicing his English and learning English and he's doing really, really well. And sometimes I talk too fast, I know it, uh, but sometimes he talks too fast in Spanish for me. You know, I speak Spanish. But we made an agreement that we're going to do our best, and he has practiced his English. If at any time Diego feels like he just needs to cut loose in Spanish, I will translate. So we'll, we'll make sure that we're all comfortable and everybody understands everybody uh, because we really want to share the spirit of this. And I, if I can give you the preface of what I'd like to take away from today, for myself as well as for everybody that's attending. Um, a lot of times when we hear the word service, whether it comes from church or it comes from profession or it comes from the Red Cross or it comes from um, our companies, there's times where we feel this sort of feeling of, I don't want to be obligated to serve somebody. And yet we feel that obligation. Now, I still think that we get blessings when we serve under obligation or under fear but it is in no way the best part of service. And so one of the things that uh, Liz Bussey had talked about, even with her serving, was how important it was for her to feel inside herself that she was being called in that moment to serve. And so what I'd like us to do is, whether it happens during this webinar or it happens over the next week, is as we reflect in our quiet time, as we take that time to really think about who am I and what is my purpose, and then just be silent and feel that feeling and motivation from inside. Now, it still might be scary. I know sometimes I get feelings of things that scare the heck out of me, 
But if I know they come from deep inside me, I have faith and courage that I am being called to do that service, to help somebody or to do something that will help somebody in return. And so I just want to give you that challenge to differentiate between the idea of obligation to serve and feeling a calling to serve or a stewardship to serve. So if we can preface with that, um, what I'd like to do is have uh, Diego, why don't you just tell the audience a little bit about yourself. He's going to be a big player in the Pilates world um, coming up. And um, and I'll, I'll finish off whatever he doesn't toot his own horn about, because I think he's going to be a very <laughs> valuable asset to the Pilates community. Diego, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, thank you very much, Brent, for, for your invitation. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Diego Ballesteros. I am from Madrid, Spain. Please be patient with me because I started to learn English one year ago and it's a bit stressful for me, this situation, but I, I'm here. I am the founder and CEO of Biwi, a software company. It's very similar to MindBody Online. Uh, um, we are specializing in digitizing, uh, helping with the management of small and medium businesses in the wellness world. I consider myself a, a serial entrepreneur. I have spent all my life uh, setting up startups and I, I have created uh, five companies. I started my first dot com in 1997 before Google even existed. And, uh, it, it was a laser guide similar to Yelp.com, uh, but the business died during the dot com bubble, uh, was my first failure. Uh, just after I, I met a guy who was very young at the time, Juan Nieto. He told me about something called the, the Pilares method. I had no idea what it was, but I love everything that I heard and understood that there was an opportunity. Uh, we created a company called Mundo Salud in the center of Madrid uh, and were very innovative, launching a business that we named uh, Corporate Wellness, which took treatments to the companies. Uh, after, after this beautiful adventure with Juan, uh, he continued his journey in the Pilares world and I returned to the world of the internet. Uh, I launched a, an online food delivery platform called Sindelantal, uh, in English is without an, an apron. It's a platform very similar to grabhub.com in the US, first in Spain and then in Mexico. I was living in Mexico for three years. Uh, this has been my, my greatest success to date. My life is full of sequels and uh, my current company, Biwi, is one of them. It's a story that was left unfinished when I opened the Pilates Center with Juan in Madrid. We decided to develop a software adapted to our needs with the idea to sell the software later to other studios. But Mundo Salud was acquired by the international healthcare company Bupa and that period was put on the back burner. As you can guess, that's the origin of Biwi. And today we have thousands of studios in more than, than 20 countries. And that's my experience today. Awesome. Thank you, Diego. It's been great uh, getting to know Diego and watching how fast he is making things available to us as we are pivoting in this critical time and just doing a lot of things out of a service mind, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, before we go any further, I have Kim Jabalisco with me. So, Kim, it's great to uh, to have you on. And, of course, um, I always love introducing Kim. You know, Kim comes with an advanced movement uh, science degree, uh, MFA in dance, and has taught in a number of universities and is a leader in um, movement science. She's one of our senior educators in Polestar and has been for many years. Um, she also has been married to one of my really good colleagues and friends, <laughs> Bob Turner, uh, who works at HSS and, and just contributes a lot to the dance medicine world. And we've been good buds in there for almost 30 years. Um, she also has been a major contributor to the PMA. So she served, uh, we served together in a couple different capacities. And that's been great in the, uh, in the certification committee. We served together for many years. She's on the board now. She's uh, and what I what I actually like and appreciate the most about Kim, and I'm introducing her for herself because I always like <laughs> her, um, is that I know how much she loves her students. Like it is amazing, and I think that's one of the main reasons why I want her on this program is because 
I've watched her in a university setting. I've watched her obviously in the pole star setting. I've watched her in the dance world as well. Um, you know, she was uh, understudy of Murray Lewis and Tom um, Caravaglia and uh, two of her mentors. And she continues to provide mentorship to dancers and um, always comments on how she feels like Murray and, and uh, Lou are sitting on her shoulder or different things, just whispering to her and to help her in that process of mentoring and guiding you know, future dancers, future Pilates teachers, future educators um, in the profession. And I've been able to, you know, tap in either virtually or to show up in person and some of her study groups and have always just felt this incredible compassion that is selfless and driven purely on being able to serve these students or the people she's working with. So I appreciate that wholeheartedly, Kim. Um, and there's a whole lot more to Kim than that. Uh, but what I'd like to do, Kim, is I, I think most of our community probably on this call have an idea of who you are and the roles that I just mentioned, you know, in and uh, in the service you provide and also the people that you treated in New York and other cities in the country. What I'd like to do is just ask you a question. And, you know, this is a personal question, but what motivates you? to serve or give to the community? Like what, what is it that drives Kim Jibalisco to go that extra mile that is obviously above the pay grade um, to be able to, to serve? Well, I, a lot of it stems from the fact that both Murray Lewis and Tom Carvalho saw something in me and they felt it was important to help me manifest my potential. And I would say that they were probably uh, two of the the only people in my life that consistently, unconditionally helped me manifest my potential. And as a tribute to them, and also because I believe in the power of helping people manifest their potential, how that shifts the universe and how that makes the world a better place to live in, that's really what drives me. I love I love watching people surprise themselves with what they didn't think they could do. When that comes to life, it's so moving. Yeah, that is a very rewarding moment. I appreciate that as well. Um, Diego, tell us a little bit about what motivates you to serve, uh, you know, or to give back to the community. What are what are some deep motivating factors for you? Uh, well, the world is too unbalanced. Uh, I find a lot of social difference in the countries where I have lived or work, and I believe that it's in our hands to change it. I am an entrepreneur who specializes in technology, and I think that there is a direct connection between technological innovation and social innovation. In Spain and Latin America, there is a great percentage of companies that have not begun their digital transformation, for example. In fact, in this crisis, they are suffering the consequences of not being fully prepared to work remotely. And it's here that I see a link between technology and, and social through a startup uh, with the goal of helping others. Uh, how? Uh, my, my idea is boosting a company which offers services to businesses like uh, management of social media, developing websites, apps, uh, big data, etc., and all operated by underprivileged young people which can play an important role in their work and professional development. Um, the companies, for example, that contract these services now uh, know, know that with their investment, in addition to receiving what their business needs, they are helping these um, privileged young people. Uh, my idea is with the profits made, we can help more young people by opening new offices uh, in other cities and at the same time, uh, closing agreements with large companies uh, so that they can hire our young people when they are ready and can leave the position open to, to others. This is how I, I, I will unite technological and social innovation. And my idea is that my, my next company will be 100% dedicated to helping others. You know, this, this ties into um, a favorite scripture of mine, which was, you know, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, you teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. And what you're talking about, Diego, is creating um, not only opportunities to work and to earn their living, but also the idea of self-esteem. This was a very fundamental thing that Joseph Pilates talked about was, 
you know, to be able to have the self-confidence that was built in your in your posture alone and and to you know be aware of who you are. And and when I do spiritual um, study, I always think of how important it is to recognize our divine nature. And I think of people that come from underprivileged communities often are beaten down over and over and over again. And by providing them this desire you're talking about of um, a career, an education, a successful opportunity to be an entrepreneur or to work in a business that's thriving, um, not only provides for them physically or temporally, but it is a spiritual contribution to their divine nature of them understanding, you know, if we look at uh, the hierarchy of needs, right? So we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs where a lot of times we're just living. And right now, a lot of us are just living in this area of like, I just need food and I need shelter. And I, some of us are fighting for breath, right? So some of us are fighting for our last breath that are suffering from COVID-19. And so that puts us in a very primitive state but anything we can do to create that opportunity for people to, you know, have self-fulfillment, um, to have self-worth, to understand that they have value, to recognize the beauty that's inside of them. I think there's another, you know, idea of like, how do we contribute to that? So that's, that's a great thing. Um, I want you to continue, Diego, on another question I have for you. And, um, and I'll come back to you, Kim, on the same question so you can be thinking about it. But I'm curious of where does desire for you to serve or it, the desire of what you're talking about here, building in your businesses to, to help other people help themselves. And I'm just curious, where does that come from? What in your childhood, your growing up, your work experience, where did that start? Yeah, um, I, I am the youngest of five siblings. Um, I'm from a humble background. Uh, my, my parents were orphaned in the Spanish Civil War and had to emigrate to Madrid when they were children. The economic difficulties were constant in my family, but my parents never transmitted these problems to us. Uh, quite the opposite. Uh, we grew up surrounded by a feeling of security and a lot of love. Um, this is why, well, while I was studying, I joined a political party looking for a way to change the, the world and, and reduce inequality. But I didn't like what I saw at, at all in politics. Everyone was looking out for their own interests, so I decided to leave the political sphere. Um, I have been always a, an idealist, and I asked myself, uh, why not create my own business and transmit my beliefs to those that work with me. In a way, this is the main reason why I decided to be an entrepreneur and help others. I certainly resonate with the idea of being an entrepreneur and, uh, and you know, moving in that direction. So, so Kim, what about you? So where does, where does that come from in Kim Jibalisco's upbringing or professional experience? Well, I too come from a very large family and, um, I think that innately when you have a lot of brothers and sisters in your house and both of your parents are working and you're home a lot together, you just to thrive, learn how to serve one another and take care of one another. And I, I have taken a lot of um, a lot of pride and love in taking care of my younger brothers. And um, it taught me a lot from a young age how important it is to give back to the people that you're sharing your life with and how enriching it is to your own life when you put something back in the cycle of energy, how enriching that is. Yeah. I also found that, you know, as I began entering the workforce and particularly in university settings, I struggled with the equality between male and females um, from everything, you know, our salaries to the expectations. And I felt that the only way to really make an impact was to become active. And how do you become active in shifting the paradigm, particularly in inequality between male and female? Well, you mentor more females <laughs> because a lot of females of my generation, including myself, were mentored by men. I was mentored by two amazing men, thank God. But we have learned very much how to treat each other based on the way men treat women. And I have found that the more women mentor other women, the more they are inspired to come into leadership roles and to really manifest their potential because 
they begin to understand that they are truly equal and that there shouldn't be any sexism in the way that we go to work, in the way that we want to serve other people. So a lot of it came from my childhood and a lot of it came from my interest in wanting to shift. And I learned from a young age not to rely on people. <laughs> and if I wanted something to shift, I needed to take responsibility for that shift and perpetuate it and keep moving it forward. So I make a big effort to always mentor young women in my life. I also mentor young men. And I think that having a female mentor as in addition to male mentors creates a sense of equanimity and harmony between men and women in, in all areas that we lead our lives in. Oh. You know, I remember being with uh, Alexander Bolander from Germany and I were with Deepak Chopra for a training and we were at a world meditation. There were over 500 of us present and thousands remote. And uh, Deepak Chopra had made a comment that was quite strong. And he basically said, and this goes back to Diego's comment on uh, politics a little bit and to Kim's comment on equality. Um, but he made a very interesting comment that there would never be world peace unless the world was led by true um, women. And he made a comment that was interesting. He said, not women trying to act like men, but women that embrace the attributes that we're talking about here. So I felt like it wasn't necessarily, I think we often associated with women, but my greatest mentor was my mother. So you know, she taught me how to iron my shirts. We were four boys and one girl and how to sew and how to cook and how to clean dishes and keep, keep your space up. But she taught me much more than that. She taught me how to love and she taught me how to have compassion and how to have empathy. And, it are, those are the values that we often associate as a lot of times people have to play tough like i got to pay this tough person or i'm going to run a company i got to be the tough guy or the tough gal and what i'd like to do is sort of streamline the thinking like is it does it have anything to do with our gender does it have anything to do with our our religion does it have anything to do with our race to be somebody who is capable of unconditionally loving that is capable of exercising empathy that is able to you know, recognize the need that people have and you know, to act upon that. And um, it, it started me thinking about the idea of like, who, you know, my role model outside of my mom, um, and people know this is, is Jesus Christ. And I think that you know, I look at that role model and I've looked at Buddha and, and the similarities between them. And it's just like these kind, selfless, unconditional um, passions for, for other people. Now, a lot of people come in, they try to monetize it and capitalize on it, and they make it look like it's something it's not. But the idea, if we really look at the teachings of these great leaders and Mother Teresa, and the list goes on. One of my favorite just passed away um, uh, recently at 103 years old. And I don't know why her name is slipping my head, but that happens sometimes. <laughs> I'll come back with it. Um, but she was the one that taught. She said that we are spiritual soldiers. She's from uh, Brahma Kumaras group. And she said that um, when one of us is alert, there is safety for many. Mm -hmm. And I often think in our roles as Pilates teachers and business owners and parents and partners and community leaders, that when one of us is alert, there is safety for many. And I love that. I love that idea. Um, Kim, I'm going to come back to you one more. I want, I want you to maybe share an example of an experience um, when you realize the happiness that comes through service for yourself. Um, well, I, you know, I stay in close contact with a lot of the young dancers and pilateros that I have trained, and that's, that's a gift. They're part of my chosen family, and that's sort of how I set it up when I meet new students that come into my life. Um, when they reach out to feel safe so that they can manifest a dream or, um, you know, one of my, my current mentees reached out to me a little over a year ago and she said, I'm being held down at my job by this woman that I work for. She's being, you know, somewhat abusive and I need to get out and I don't know what to do, but somebody told me to call you and you would be able to help me. And 
and sure enough, we brainstormed together over some options and I instilled as much as I could confidence in this young, this young creative artist, creative teacher, Pilatera dancer. And she ended up leaving that job, which gave her even more confidence. She got out from under the thumb of a really powerful female that didn't know how to treat her with equality or sincerity or compassion. And watching her bloom over this last year and taking over various different leadership roles has been so fulfilling. So that's that's one thing that I often have the opportunity to witness um, all the way to watching, you know, my dancers perform on famous stages around New York City and ar around the country. And then something as, as simple and as powerful as a student calling me and saying, because of you, I'm eating. I thought I was going to starve to death because I didn't think I could teach Pilates. You let me teach Pilates in Spanish because Spanish is my native tongue. And you said, just let it flow out of your body and teach. And we'll figure out the English when you feel more comfortable. And, you know, now that person's teaching online every single day and doing lots of service also. So when you, when you realize that you in your kindness and compassion have the power to help somebody manifest their potential, I think those are the moments that I cherish the most and it keeps me wanting to give more. Thank you, Kim. Now, Diego, you and I had a conversation about um, some work that you had done with the St. Augustine nuns. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, your experience um, that, you know, I'm sure you had many, but in particular, the one with the St. Augustine nuns. But could you tell us a little bit about an experience that uh, sort of changed your life and, and um, gave you great joy through, through serving others? Yes, um, well, I, I've always done everything I could to help others. It's something that comes nat naturally to me. Uh, I have my peers at the school. I help other entrepreneurs that are starting out. I try to find work for those that need it, but, but above all, uh, I offer my help to those that uh, are most disadvantaged. For example, in my office in, in Bogota, we have various people that come from an extremely unprivileged background, and we have a, a special career plan for them. Uh, first, training to make them great professionals, and second, economic to help them make the jump to, to greater stability for them and, and their families. Today's, today, all those that started in my company are still working for us, some in, in IT as programmers, some as designers, or some as analysts in big data. And we feel very proud of the work that we are doing with them because we really have changed their lives. But uh, as you said, I have another very interesting example with some good friends who are nuns. They belong to the Order of San Agustin. And it's nonary, which is located in a beautiful place at the foot of a mountain uh, close to Madrid. Um, it's funny because they are nuns with a bit of hippie look. Um, when I find myself a, a bit lost, I, I go there uh, to walk and talk to them. Sometimes I go alone or sometimes I with my family and they always transmit a lot, a lot of peace and we come back uh, home feeling refreshed. You know? Um, their incomes came from handmade, handmade products. For example, this is uh, the cross of San Agustin made for my nuns. Um, their incomes made, made for donations too. Um, they have a, a small hostel on the Camino de Santiago. And they are hard, hard workers, but we're not making the most of technology to help them improve their operation and reach more people. So I offered to, to help them create their own startup and I created a team based on the skills and potential they each had. Thanks to everything that we did, they started to receive thousands of euros from the pilgrims that passed through their hostel um, and were thankful for the experience they had there. Um, they also started selling their products through the country and multiplied their social media following. And thanks to all the new incomes, they were able to build the church that they had been wanted to, to build for years. It was a, a, a truly marvelous experience. So what I want you to share, Diego, is how it feels in here. 
just knowing how it feels for you like what what the magnitude of that like just working with that organization what you know what um how do you sleep at night yeah. how do you feel like with your with your children seeing it and uh your wife like i want to know the emotional deep rooted aspect of of you know the fact that you know it made you so happy but what i want i want you to try to express it and if you got to go spanish you can go spanish on me i'm ready to translate <laughs> no i can try it i'm going to try it no it's incredible the experience that i live with with the nuns because they are helping me and my family for a lot of years because uh, for example the i am speaking english from one year ago because uh, my my little daughter has a very strange disease, very complicated. She has a, a blood cancer. And I, I started to learn English only to, to, to be uh, able to read the, the papers, medical papers. Um, my, my nuns, I, I, always, I always said my nuns, they, they always uh, are with me helping with my, uh, with my, with my pain. No? Um, for that reason, uh, this is the, the 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 main reason that I am helping them to to create the charts, to create the startup, um, and to work together. No, because uh, they are very very important for for my for my soul, for for my family. Uh, well, you know, we're about halfway through, and we have a few more questions that I want to ask Kim and Diego. Uh, but this is also your <laughs> webinar, so. If you have questions, please feel free to write your questions or comments. Um, if we have time, there's a lot of people on the webinar these days, so um, we're glad to try to answer as many of them as we can. I also want you, if you are impressed with Diego's English, to put a thumbs up <laughs> sign in the comment bar, uh, because I think he's doing a fantastic job for um, only practicing English for a year. So awesome, awesome job. Um, next question, I'm going to go to Kim, and Kim, just maybe um, share what you think or some advice that you'd give the audience uh, if they wanted to volunteer or give back to the community. What would you what would you tell somebody? I know people have come up to you before, but what would you tell them? What would your um, advice be? Um, firstly, I would say, you know, really sit and think about what your gift is. What, what is the thing that differentiates you from other people that you do fluidly that makes you feel like you are manifesting your greatest potential and synthesizing all the things that you know, have learned and are passionate about, and you can put them into action in your own unique way. Um, and then figure out where is there a need for that? and tell people what your dreams are like i frequently tell my students and my mentees if you don't tell me what your dream is i can't help you manifest it so if your dream is to volunteer and 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 work in the soup kitchen you have to tell enough people so that it begins to bleed to somebody that maybe isn't involved in a soup kitchen and can make a connection for you if you hold your dreams in to yourself, you will never realize them. You have to actually say them out loud. That's part of manifesting a dream. So I would say first, identify your skill set, then share your dream, share it, share what it is you want to do to help other people in the world with as many people as you can, and that begins to light a fire. Yeah, you know, Kim, there's something you've done that I, I've used many times since with your student cohorts. And that is having them identify a fingerprint project. And it ties into that idea of like, you know, what, what is unique about you? What is unique that you are going to bring to the world? What's your, what's your talent? And I think we've heard some great talents um, today uh, that have been brought forward. But I love that advice of, you know, finding unique. There's um, a couple comments here. First of all, there's like hundreds of thumbs up for Diego's English. <laughs> Diego, you, you have a new career in being in the English commentary, so you're, you're doing good. You're doing great. 
Um, Lisa said that uh, she says we're all such a blessing. So thank you, Lisa. And she asked an important question. She said, what's the best way to encourage others to serve? What's the best way to encourage others to serve? And, you know, I think this is, you know, having served in the PMA or in church or at Shake a Lake Miami, I mean, that's a question we ask ourselves every single day is like, how do we get other people to serve? Um, either of you have any thoughts on that as far as ways to motivate? Yeah, Kim? I tell all of my mentees and people that I work with that the the deal is that I'm giving to you and I'm going to support you and mentor you. And then you have to do it for at least one other person in some way. You have to keep paying it forward. So, you know, in our industry, in the Pilates industry, you can you can make a lot of money mentoring young professionals. I do not charge my mentees any money to work with me because the expectation is that they, too, will pay it forward. And, and they do, they give back. All of my mentees are offering free or donation-based classes right now online. Um, and I think that is one way it's like, you know, I'm washing your hand and now you're gonna wash another person's hand and teach people from the bottom up, from infancy up, that service is something that is learned and you learn to appreciate it in the act of doing it and perpetuating it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that, um, you know, just the idea of mentorship in and of itself, that word mentorship is, um, it's a covenant. It's it's between two people, right? So the mentor has to find the um, attraction to provide the mentorship to the mentee, and the mentee has to find uh, the attraction of the mentor to them. And so it is a symbiotic relationship but when you learn from a really good mentor you only really have one option as you mature and that is to become a great mentor um, right. and if you don't do that then you're a disservice to the mentorship that we received and I've had so many great mentors and it's so important um, that's a great relationship another word that I love is stewardship and in Spanish mayordomia but the idea of stewardship is goes beyond just duty and I think sometimes we get stuck in that sort of mindset of it's not my job um, to do that. You know, whether it's in an education setting or a patient setting or a family setting or a business setting, that stewardship takes it a little bit further of understanding, you know, how, how do I become that mentor? How do I provide leadership in service in the community? And I think that you know, the, the best way to influence people to serve is to be out there with a shovel in your hand or to be out there at that meeting serving in the morning and be excited about it and genuine. And I go back to Liz Bussey's thing. It's like, if you're feeling an obligation to serve, it's coming from the wrong place. You'll still be blessed for doing it and everybody would go, oh, look, he's serving. Good. Good for him. But it's not the best reward. That's not the best reward is when you get that phone call that Kim talked about that somebody says, you know, what you taught me changed my life. That's, nobody else in the world sees it or hears it. Here's my box of tissue. I told you I have a box of tissue. <laughs> but nobody sees that. But that's the reward that sometimes comes. That's what I was sort of looking for. Diego, do you have any advice for, you know, somebody that is, you know, wants to encourage others to serve, how you've been able to get others to serve or to follow your lead? Yeah, the, the, the advice that I would give is encapsulated by a quote from the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Muhammad Yunus. Uh, the quote says, uh, making money is a happiness, and that's a, a great incentive, but making other people happy is a super happiness. Um, Junus is, is my reference as a great social entrepreneur and his story is wonderful. Uh, around 15 years ago in India, Junus found out uh, that there were women in a neighboring village that were being exploited by law and sarks and he decided to loan $27 from his pocket to 42 of them without any warranties. He discovered that the women paid their debts punctually and their motivation was clear. They didn't want to fall into the hands of the loan sharks again. 
Um, in the following years, Junius created his famous Grameen Bank for the Poor, and from then on, he has loaned more than $6,000 million, with 99% of loans being repaid. Um, Junius considers that capitalists went astray by disregarding its social function and proposes that entrepreneurs create social companies instead of making donations. Um, the social companies proposed by Junius operate like it, any other company, but the profits uh, are reinvested and the partners don't receive dividends. Uh, while in a traditional company, the goal is to earn money, in a social company, the goal is to solve a social problem. In charity, money goes out. It does a great job, but doesn't come back. But if you create a social company, the money goes out, does the same job, but returns to your hands, uh, to your hands and you can invest it again in another social initiative. Thank you, Diego. That's so important. And I, again, it goes back to that teach somebody to fish and you feed them for a lifestyle kind of idea. I love that. And um, we got some comments in here. Um, Sheila wanted us to acknowledge that uh, Diego's English is amazing and wanted to know <laughs> what program you're using to be able to learn English so fast. All the English that I, that I know is by myself. Listening, 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 a lot of podcasts, watching videos on YouTube, uh, talking with some friends uh, from England or United States and read, try to read. For example, now I am reading Option B. Is the it's a very good uh, book. Today is the day of the book, you know, in the world. And this is a, a book, for example, that I am reading now. And this is my my tips to learn another language. I think the most important thing is listening, for me. Thanks, Diego. Um, we had uh, Sylvia uh, made a comment. She says, do you consider this moment that we are going through as a gift? Yeah. And I believe yeah, that this is this an incredible opportunity for Pilates lovers to come together. Um, and I'll tell you, my, I, I think any time there's a moment of reflection, it is a gift. And I, you know, it's... Um, so it might sound a little bit morbid, but even even when we are celebrating the life of a loved one who has passed on, sometimes create the greatest moments of reflection and evaluation of who we are and who we represent. And maybe asking the question of, you know, what are they going to say about me at my funeral kind of thing? You know, it's like, am I, am I the person that that I'm supposed to be? And I think when the whole world is taking a rest right now, right? So we know the water's cleaner and we got jellyfish and dolphins in Venice and, you know, the air is cleaner and the people can't figure out what to do with all the oil that's not being used right now. They're trying to give it away because, um, you know, we're taking a rest and we're having a chance to reflect and we're having to be creative. And, um, you know, we're, who are being asked to do things that actually serve each other. Staying home and respecting that is actually serving our neighbors. It's actually serving our elderly to be able to minimize the spread of COVID-19, to wear a mask is serving other people. So I think there's a lot of different aspects of this. I don't know, Kim, do you want to take a shot at uh, Sylvia's question about whether or not this is potentially a gift for us in the Pilates community? I think that this pandemic is going to shift the way that the world ticks, honestly. And I think it's really going to shift the way that we treat each other and develop a greater sense of how we fit into the world and our responsibility to community. So, you know, it's unfortunate that something this catastrophic needed to happen to sort of raise the consciousness yeah, I agree but with that. There's no, yeah, there's no way we'll ever go back to the way things were. Yeah. There's yeah, no I, way we're ever going to go back to that. I'm a little afraid to use the word gift, but I think that it is a pivot point for humanity right now to choose where we're going to go. Who are we going to be tomorrow with these challenges? Mm -hmm. We got a few more comments that came in. 
Um, our good and dear friend Lockie from Australia tapping in here. I don't know, it's the middle of the night or something for you, Lockie, but we're glad <laughs> you're here. Um, he says, I'm super inspired by your stories and humble history. Can I ask how you got you guys handle setbacks and failures in the serving process? Thank you. So um, Diego as well, you're welcome to answer this question, but when we've confronted failure in trying to serve or maybe to establish leadership and service and how we cope with that. Either of you want to take that on? I think I need that translation for your question now. <laughs> uh, that's perfect. So, él está diciendo que aunque hablamos de lo bueno que sentimos de servir, a veces sí. fracasamos. Y él quiere saber cómo nosotros Portamos con eso fracasamiento en servir o ayudar o ser líder de servir. ¿Cómo es que, cómo es que nosotros podemos uh, aguantar eso? ¿Cómo, cómo, es que, ¿Cómo lo haces tú? Ok. Um, well, um, I think if, if Fly has a smile on you, and you have the opportunity to help others, uh, we have the moral obligation to, to do it, no? Uh, you can fail or not fail, but I, I think we have the, the moral obligation to, to do it. Um, for example, now I, we are helping a, a lot of studios. Uh, during the last few weeks, we have been locked in my, co in my company, creating a, a huge amount of new tools to help our clients and, and other studios so that they can be in touch with their customers and their incomes don't fall to zero. Uh, we have called all these <coughs> features be we, be we Home, um, and we offer the option to stream classes live, create, create online courses, create online events for hundreds of people, offer classes at home. Um, all of the services that we are offering are for free and with no commitment or cuts. The only goal is to help at this difficult time, no? Um, well, I think I think we, we have the obligation to to help others in in any situation. So, in other words, whether or not people take advantage of what you're offering, it feels good to offer what you're offering. I think is the is the key. Kim, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, you know, um, hi, Luck. I'm glad you're here. Um, and I, you know, I have definitely had some failed mentor mentee relationships over the course of my career. And I'll tell you that really the thing that I think has helped me become more successful in being able to serve others is being reflective. So, you know, when I find that the relationship isn't going well, I first ask myself, how did I participate or how did I play a role in the failure of this communication breakdown? And then what I have found over the years is that if the clearer I am getting into the relationship with a mentee in terms of these are the these are the rules of this relationship, right? So a rule would be something like if you ask me to do something for you, I expect a response once I do that thing for you to tell me whether or not it was helpful or you needed more help. So like, you know, you want me to proof your resume for you and I proof it and I send it back and you don't ever get back to me. That's a problem with the relationship, <laughs> right? I need to know A, that you received the time investment that I put in and B, whether or not that was helpful to you or if you need more help. So, you know, there are communication rules that you sort of need to set up at the beginning so that you can better help each other develop the relationship in a healthy, balanced manner. Um, and and when relationships haven't gone well, you know, sometimes it's not always a good fit. Um, at this point, when I take on new mentees, I actually sort of we have like a, a chat before we agree we're going to get into a relationship together. And I determine whether or not I can really help them. You know, there are people that have needs that I'm not an expert in meeting. And I might be able to direct them to somebody else. So I have to understand too, what am I good enough at to help somebody? And and if if I accept somebody and the relationship goes sour, um, you know, my one of my yoga teachers has said to me, you know, Kim, sometimes you have to give people back to God. You you tried, 
not all relationships are meant to be and you can lovingly sort of break up with them and let them move on to somebody that can help them not everybody's meant to be in a relationship with you yeah that was going to be my comment on that is i think a lot of times you know we give with good intention we give with um you know we give our all and we don't get the response we want and you know this is this is about relationships and i think of you know i think of God giving me everything and me not communicating back to him. So am I the best communicator or her? I, am I the best communicator? Um, you know, so sometimes we, we lose sight of this. And I remember a parable of a master who had a servant who had some debt with him. And um, he forgave him of the debt because he needed the help. And then that servant went around and started beating people up to try to get them to pay the debt that they owed him. So when uh, the Lord of the, the town there found out that he was doing that, you know, he basically said, you're, you're an ungrateful person. And I think we have to look at and think of who's serving us and who are we serving? And this is the whole idea of pay it forward, right? Um, I think sometimes if we're doing things with the sense of some kind of obligation back to us, we're missing the beauty of unconditional love. So I think sometimes we have to be able to just deliver because it comes from our heart, has to come from our, our heart. I think if we come with the expectation of having something come back to us, it's nice, it feels good, it's nice to see, but it doesn't always lock you. And I think that's the thing is that, you know, we have to find that inner motivation that we're doing it for the sake of humanity. Um, I wanna share a short story with you and then I got about three or four more comments. We're getting close to the end of the hour. Um, this is a very personal one. I haven't told it to many people, but when my uh, father-in-law was living with us, um, he was in his very last stage of life and uh, wasn't doing well. And um, Lizette and I went over to the guest house to help her mother um, get him ready for bed. And we had to change him and get him in bed. And we walked in and he had made a mess of the whole room. I won't go into details of what it was, but I'll tell you it's things that I don't like to touch or have to deal with. So um, it's 11 o'clock at night and Lizette and I are cleaning up this room and cleaning up her mother and cleaning up her father well into three or four o'clock in the morning. It was such a mess. And we get back home or to our room and we kneel down and we're saying our prayers and asking God, how long do we have to suffer this? Like, how long do we have to put up with this? And I received this really strong impression that until you can learn to love him for the sake of humanity, he is going to be in your life. There was nothing coming back in this relationship. But the lesson that I had to learn and Lizette had to learn was that we had to love on the condition of humanity not of the individual, not with an expectation to come back to us, not with somebody saying, you're really good people. Because in that moment, it didn't matter. All that mattered was that we understood that we were doing it for the sake of humanity. And there was some inner peace when we accepted that, that was beyond explanation. Very powerful. But that's because if we expect the immediate gratification of service, we will be disappointed. It doesn't come all the time. There are times it does and it feels great and it's warm, but it's not all the time. And maybe some of those blessings aren't geared for us in this, tem in this temporal lifetime. Maybe it's not that. But I hope my kids saw it. So when I'm that person in that bed, <laughs> they take care of me for the sake of humanity, right? Because they understand that it's our role in humanity to serve without expectations. There are a couple of good comments here that I wanted to share, and then we do need to come to a close. Um, as I want to say your name correctly, and I'm going to say Sitakat. And if I said it wrong, please um, correct me on the enunciation of it. 
um, said, you've inspired me to look into social companies, Diego, and I recently moved to Africa and have been trying to find ways to give back. And then uh, commented, why does Brent always make us cry when he's about to talk about <laughs> service? Well, that's because I'm a big boob. And my mom taught me how to be sensitive. And so I embrace that sensitivity. I'm not ashamed of it. There was somebody else a comment for Diego. Let me see where it is. Oh, right here. So Ruth, Ruth said, querer es poder. Great English to you. So the comment. Um, Sylvia said, here in Brazil, we are helping each other a lot and creating new opportunities. We are on a webinar in different parts of the world and with similar needs. Thank you so much for sharing amazing moments. Thank you, Sylvia. Becky said, I'm a mentee of Kim's. Since she is a three, it has made things easier that she is so clear and concise about what she expects. That way I don't feel like I'm taking advantage of her. I think that's the guidelines that uh, Kim talked about that are so important in these relationships. Um, Sheila said, just heard someone at church say he felt frustrated about his kids not thanking him. And someone else said, how do you think God must feel? <laughs> there was total <laughs> silence when people realized what he had just said. Thank you for that, Sheila. Um, Rose said, thank you, Brent, for your transparency and glorifying God in our suffering and pain. And Sarah said, very powerful story. Thank you for sharing. So it sort of brings us to the end of, um, of our time here. And again, if I couldn't impress enough with our guests and with our stories that the desire to serve has to come from inside. It, in an ideal world, should be something that is unconditional without expecting things in return. However, I think Kim pointed out very clearly that the better communication we have in these relationships of service, that the more likely it is that they will pay it forward and be able to provide those services in the future and respect that relationship that exists. And there are so many different ways to serve. I can't express, you know, I come from, you know, a family of service. I come from a church of service. I, I love serving. Um, I love being able to um, to get lost in service, and those are some of my happiest times in my life. And you know, I, I just want um, I want the world to to be a better place. I want the the world to be filled with compassion and to be filled with creativity and looking for solutions for world problems that we have and problems that exist right in our neighborhood right in our own homes of uh, things that we can make the world a better place and just stop and be silent and let, let the universe tell us what that is that we're to do. Whether it be what Diego did of helping nuns be able to build a church or Kim raising a bunch of great leaders in the dance and Pilates community, uh, it's not, it, it, it's not, important either way right or it's important both ways it, there's so many ways to serve um kim you got any last minute things you want to share with the group yeah you know i'm very moved by the story of your father-in-law brent and i just it made me remember and i think about this a lot um i often sign my email for the pma this way in service and and service is a privilege and it's an honor if somebody asks you to serve them it's truly an honor because they're trusting you to create a safe place for them to land. And I think that if we perceive offering service as an honor and as a privilege, we will be even more propelled to give of ourselves. Thank you, Kim. Diego, any last comments you want to say to the audience? Yes, um, uh, I agree. With Kim, uh, we are we have the privilege to help others, and it's an honor. Uh, and I think we are we have the obligation to help others, in, in my opinion. Um, thank you, Brent, for your invitation. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Kim, for your company, and thanks to all <laughs> for your passion with me because my my Spanish my Spanish actions is terrible. <laughs> and thank you, thank you very much for your for your passion. Well, thank you both. 
um, just want to close by asking blessings on everybody in this difficult time and that we might be inspired with creativity uh, to help others and uh, um, certainly including all of you in our prayers for your family and loved ones especially those that are suffering right now from uh, the stress of COVID-19 uh, both physically spiritually and economically uh, I would like to petition that everybody in your own way uh, petition your higher source to, um, you know, to relieve us from, from these stresses that are challenging us and that we might learn from these stresses, that we might be able to pivot and to find a better way to coexist, to live in peace. And I can tell you one thing, the ability for me to communicate with people from all around the world has improved 400%. And um, I'm also really thankful for um, offers like what BWE has made of, you know, being able to have software from home that doesn't cost anything to be able to make it through here. Um, we'll provide you those links as we always do at the end. I have a bunch of uh, different quotes on service from I think every faith that I know of, um, uh, just to be able to show that it is a universal concept that we find our greatest happiness when we are in the service of others. And the world would like us sometimes to think differently. They'd like us to think that it's in that nice Gucci purse or the hot car that we drive or the beautiful homes that we live in. But really the happiness comes from the service we provide to humanity. And when we provide them, whatever that is, whatever it is and however big or small it is, um, that that is where the greatest joy can be found. And my wishes are that all of us find that joy, that we can have that joy in our lives. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Next week, it's going to be Shelly Power and myself and my daughter, Nicole, are going to be talking and sharing with you on ways to prepare to open our doors as Pilates Studios in the upcoming months as we prepare to have some of the isolations removed. So we hope you'll join us with your questions and that uh, you find your resources here at the Polestar Pilates Hour. Remember, it's free. Tell your friends. And uh, most importantly, we love you and wish you the very best. Thank you.